I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 21 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rice proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I move the motion. The motion being uh, a matter of public urgency, the urgent need for the Morrison government to announce science-based 2030 targets, that, given that it has completely failed Australians on climate change, using up, uh, using up over 40 per cent of Australia's carbon budget since 2013. Well, the Prime Minister is now sort of vaguely talking about 2050 and Labor are talking about 2050. The science says that 2050 is too late. A report was released uh, last week that says actually what we do in the next 10 years is what counts. The critical decade is now. 2050 targets are very attractive for do-nothing governments, do-nothing oppositions and do-nothing businesses that don't want anything to be done in the critical decade. 2050 targets with no policies is just code for someone else's problem. We need science-based targets to be guiding our climate policies in this nation. Delay is the new denial. Now, the Climate Targets Panel uh, report that I referred to that was released last week says that to have a chance of staying within two degrees of warming, the government's 2030 targets need to be doubled. We need to halve the pollution that we aspired uh, to uh, have by 2030 if we are to have a chance at keeping within two degrees. That report also clarifies that if we want to have a chance at keeping within one and a half degrees, which might actually save what's left of global coral reefs, um, it might lessen the burden um, on our farmers and our agricultural sectors, um, it might lessen the severity of the natural disasters that we've all been facing. It's in fact what we should be aspiring to as a nation. But if we want to stay within one and a half degrees, then in fact we need to reduce our pollution by 75 per cent by 2030. So this report saying the government needs to double its targets to even have a chance at two degrees, but actually we need far more uh, strong action on the climate crisis if we want to have a chance of saving the planet as we know it. So, the discussion about 2050 is over. The question is, what's the government going to do about their 2030 targets, and when on earth are we going to see a 2030 target from this flaccid opposition? They continue to bat away the question, it is not good enough. We need science-based targets, and we need all parties to be guided by them. It should not be a question of politics. This should simply be us taking the advice from the experts. We have a small window. Now, the Biden uh, president's Climate Summit is coming up in April. Now We might not even get invited. Um, we didn't get much of a Guernsey last time, did we? And This Prime Minister has absolutely no credibility on the global stage on climate, so we might not even be invited to President Biden's April Climate Summit. But if we are, what's the Prime Minister going to do? Is he actually going uh, to comply with what the science says? Is he going to increase that 2030 target? It is untenable for the government to continue to insist that these weak, pathetic targets that we're not even on track to meet are adequate. Um, and it's untenable for the opposition to continue to ignore the need for 2030 targets and to promise to tell us all at some point who knows when. Um, that independent climate targets panel did that work last week. The Climate Change Authority should be doing that week. But they've updated those targets based on um, our global carbon budget. Net zero by 2050 isn't even what the science says anymore. So that's a bit of a problem for the Prime Minister and for the Labor Party. The latest data says that, in fact, we need to have net zero by 2045, not 2050. Um, and in fact, for one and a half degrees, we need to be net zero by 2035. The other very troubling finding from that report was that since this mob took government in 2013, that we've used 40 per cent of our two-degree budget 
and 55 per cent of our one and a half degree budget. We cannot muck around any longer. We may or may not get an invite to that Biden climate summit, but the world is watching what we do. The Prime Minister sees risks, the Greens see opportunities, and we see consequences for continuing to ignore this problem. The Liberals and Nationals will send Australian farmers bankrupt as the new climate dries lands out along the coast and floods it in unbearable heat in the north. The only way we can avoid that future is with strong, science-based 2030 targets. We invite the Labor Party to say something about that and the government to double their ambition in that regard. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, here we go again. The Greens fixated on lots of talk and no action when it comes to the provision of clean energy and the lowering of emissions. The topic of alternative energy through new technology is one that is close to my heart, having dedicated much of my time to the wonderful Hunter region, where traditional mining takes place alongside an area booming with developing new on energy sources. On one recent visit, I was able to break ground at the site of a new lithium-ion battery factory, where the technology team of Energy Renaissance is supported by the CSIRO. The Commonwealth Government's first low emissions technology statement has identified energy storage as a priority technology for Australia to support emission reductions and jobs growth. Affordable and reliable batteries are already becoming a critical element of renewable electricity supply, clean transport and for use in a range of defence applications. Australia is a world leader in the implementation of batteries on the grid, but we're using foreign companies to supply our batteries, making this a future energy security issue. An Australian supply reduces the risk in shipping, transportation and delivery and provides the Australian government and its key agencies, such as Defence, with a domestic option. China accounts for 62 per cent of the global lithium-ion battery industry. Quite simply, if we want more electric cars and buses and to reduce our emission levels, we're going to need more batteries. Australia is ideally placed to be at the forefront of development and manufacture of these in-demand products. The early establishment of a domestic battery manufacturing industry will value add to critical minerals processed in Australia. According to the Future Batteries Industry, there is currently no commercial production of battery grade materials and chemicals in Australia. However, the wonderful new energy renaissance site at Tomago will be the first in Australia with plans to export much of its batteries to Asian markets. On the same day as I broke ground at the energy renaissance site, I visited the Bloomfield coal mine in East Maitland, where 600 Australian workers are employed, producing, much, uh, producing some of the highest quality coal in the world. And we won't turn our back on any industry that supports the energy of Australians. And kudos to the Australian hunter-based company Quarry Mining that's converting its big mining trucks to electric power. There are other local Hunter Valley and Newcastle businesses who are getting on with the innovation and commercialisation that will drive our economic growth and provide renewable sources of power. And these are the sorts of businesses that the Morrison government is backing. The Hunter region is a hotbed of energy innovation. MGA Thermal is a local company using renewable power to heat aluminium bricks during the day and generate steam from them overnight. And the Morrison government has promised to build a gas plant powered specifically to ensure that hunter businesses and consumers don't suffer the devastating consequences of energy shortages or blackouts. We remain committed to any technology that promises energy reliability and affordable comfort for all Australians. I'm supporting the hunter in its bid to win the tender to be the first hydrogen hub funded by the Commonwealth. I'm working with local industries, renewable providers and other key institutions to put forward a case to make the Hunter a home for hydrogen development. With hydrogen, we can capitalise on the growing international market for green steel and green aluminium, using the abundance of intermittent renewable energy to generate hydrogen to power these industries. There is no better place than the new hotbed of innovation for such a venture. The fact that it would create more jobs and bring investment to the region 
is another bonus for Australia. Our government is investing $570 million in hydrogen. Hydrogen can be stored and transported, and it can be 100 per cent cleaner. It's a wonderful source of energy for manufacturing and has the potential to further lower our energy emissions. We will continue to support this sector, which also has the potential to see Australia export hydrogen to other countries. New energy technologies will expand production and increase productivity. Madam Acting Deputy President, we're not resting on our laurels when it comes to alternative energy sources, and we will not rest until Australians and my great friends in the Hunter Valley have guaranteed cheap and secure sources of energy. And it will be done with consideration for Australian businesses and consumers. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has promised that we won't tax our way to zero emissions. We won't put that burden on any Australian, especially our regional Australians. Getting to net zero is all about technology, and our emissions fell by 3 per cent in the year to June 2020, the lowest level since 1998. That's 17 per cent below 2005 levels, and that's pretty impressive when you consider it. Our Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, has committed to investing $1.9 billion for the development of clean energy. And when it comes to lowering emissions, we have an enviable record that's proving successful and is focused on technology, not taxes. We have a clear plan. We're on track to meet our 2030 target. Labor doesn't even have a 2030 target. And our 2030 target is more ambitious than Norway, Canada, Germany, France and New Zealand. And we want to get to zero emissions as soon as is possible. And we're focused on the how and the breakthroughs in technology that will be needed to reach net zero emissions. Over the past two years, our position against our 2030 target has improved by 639 million tonnes. That's the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road, just wait for it, for 15 years. In 2020, a record seven gigawatts of new renewable capacity was installed in Australia. That's more renewables in one year under the Morrison government than under the whole previous Labor government term. Australia now has the highest amount of solar PV capacity installed per person in the world. And we have the most wind and solar per person of any country outside of Europe. We're adopting renewables in Australia at 10 times the global average, four times higher than China, Japan, the US and Europe. And we're doing it without sacrificing jobs and industries in regional Australia for no emissions benefit. Instead, the Morrison government is focused on the how and on the breakthroughs in technology that will be needed to make net zero emissions possible. Investing and supporting renewable technologies will support 130,000 130, new jobs by 2030 and maintain Australia's position as a world-leading exporter of food, fibre, minerals and energy. In contrast, Labor won't talk about how they would lower emissions because they have no plan to achieve net zero, no plans, not a single policy. They continue to be divided and confused on energy matters which impact everyday Australians. Our government is committed to ensuring a reliable energy supply. And as our Prime Minister announced yesterday, agreements are in place to accelerate major transmission projects in New South Wales and Tasmania, with Victoria and South Australia to follow this year. And we're building Snowy Hydro too. We're rolling out a $200 million program to build new diesel storage facilities. Minister Karen Andrews is investing $1.5 billion in a manufacturing strategy prioritising critical minerals processing, recycling and clean energy. This is a government committed to technology-driven sources of energy. We need practical and appropriate measures to reduce emissions in a way that supports economic growth. Labor and their Green partners have never committed so much money or support to groundbreaking technology that will enhance our energy development and secure our energy supply. But we are getting on with the job of lowering emissions 
and creating viable new renewable energy industries that will support every Australian. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Lyons. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise in support of this motion today. And right now, as I speak, an out-of-control bushfire is threatening the outer suburbs of the Perth metropolitan area. And horrifically, it's been reported that 30 homes have been destroyed. Thankfully, uh, no loss of life has been reported. But the bushfire is raging out of control. We know at Tilden Park in Gijiganup, 80 per cent of homes have been lost. And of course, my absolute uh, sympathy goes to those homeowners uh, and their family and friends who have been affected so far. But we know the bushfire right now is far from out. And indeed, um, just earlier speaking to colleagues, we know it has jumped the Great Eastern Highway. We know in the Perth metropolitan area you only have to look at the bomb site. Um, there is a smoke haze right across the Perth metropolitan area. We've seen um, reports of um, leaves on fire being reported at Wanneroo. That is a long way, for those that don't know Western Australia and the Perth metro area, from the centre of the fire. As far as uh, Fremantle and Rottnest, we're having smoke haze reported. This is a devastating event happening right now in Perth um, and shows no sign of slowing down. What's also happened across Western Australia, and particularly Perth, over the last couple of weeks, we've had extraordinarily high temperatures. In Perth now, when it's 35, we think it's a pretty cool day. We've become so accustomed to much higher temperatures. In addition to that, throughout the summer, we've experienced very strong easterly winds, much stronger than we would normally experience. So all of these issues are telling us that our climate is changing. The easterly winds are a direct contributor right now to those out-of-control suburbs, out-of-control fires in the Perth metropolitan area. Uh, and Perth is a very sprawling city, and suburbs of Ellenbrook, Dayton, areas uh, in the federal seat of Pearce have been evacuated. This is not something that's happening out on the border. This is something that is happening in the Perth metropolitan region right now. Uh, and no doubt, when this fire uh, has been put out, people will start talking once again about its connection to climate change. Right now, 12 months ago, we had the devastating fires in the eastern states uh, and in South Australia, where tragically many people lost their lives, homes and businesses were destroyed, uh, livestock and people are still recovering. We still have people living in tents. And leading up to that, we had uh, Greg Mullins and 22 other former fire chiefs who were begging, begging the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, to meet with them. They hadn't just suddenly started to talk about the risk of uh, lack of inaction on climate change, linking it to bushfires. They'd been trying to meet with him, and they were mocked by the Prime Minister. Uh, they were mocked by uh, government members. And what have we heard today? Oh, this is all about Liberal and Labor. It's not people. It's about climate change. It's real. But we know still those backbench, climate-denying uh, members of the Morrison government, who they will not hold to account, are still the people controlling the Morrison government. Because you'd have to ask yourself, um, after seven years and 22 energy policy attempts, the Morrison government has no national energy policy, and they continue an anti-renewables agenda, and they are refusing to capitalise on the huge benefits that clean energy can bring to Australian households and businesses. And we've heard about, oh, we don't want to lose jobs. Never once have we heard them talk about the job creation that would happen from investing in 
uh, renewables, investing in a proper clean energy policy. And yesterday we heard some weasel words from the Prime Minister at the National Press Club because the election of um, Joe Biden in the US, suddenly his right wing uh, cloth of um, being able to hide behind with Trump has gone. So now that stark reality is that we have someone in the US uh, who is who's going to lead on uh, climate change. And that, I think, is the only reason we saw a little bit of a shift from Mr Morrison, but no plans, not one single idea about uh, job creation, about clean energy, just his throwaway line that um, he hoped to uh, get there with a reduction um, by 2050, um, hoped to get there earlier. Hope. Well, it needs more than hope, Mr Morrison. It actually needs a government that is committed to the science of climate change, that holds its backbenchers to account when they put up ridiculous notions, who accepts that climate change is real, who accepts that what's happening right now in Perth metropolitan area is real and there's a link to, to climate change. How many more reports do we have to have on the, the globe is heating up. Australia experienced its fourth hottest year on record last year. Perth is experiencing right now, today, yesterday, tomorrow, unprecedented um, high temperatures and really strong easterly winds. This is affecting people and their jobs. If the Morrison government is serious about protecting jobs, start action on climate change. I don't know how many jobs losing 30 homes in WA represents. If you look at the flow-on effect of that, of men and women and children, uh, people, young people lost their jobs. Get real. Climate change is real. Stop denying the facts. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I need to say clearly that the climate change agenda seeks to mislead well-meaning Australians with pseudoscience to introduce and hide an economic and social agenda that Australians would otherwise reject. Senator Rice's motion does mischief. Australia does not have a carbon budget. The Senate has not voted for a carbon budget. The coalition's supposed climate action plan, CAP, that underpins government policy, does not include a carbon budget. Our international agreements do not include a carbon budget. The only place one can find a climate budget is in the Greens' own little parallel universe, where the aspiring elites in the Greens are in control of an economy that is not only green but rancid. The devastation that will be caused to our economy by the measures the Greens propose to limit carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will destroy our economy, destroy jobs and steal opportunity from our children. The insult to real scientists is that Senator Rice calls climate change a science-based agenda. No, it's not. Definitely not. The argument in favour of a looming climate disaster is based on unvalidated compu computer models, nothing else. The same models that have failed repeatedly and miserably to predict temperature movement. The largest single driver of climate is the sun, which has moved into a solar minimum that is tracking the Dalton minimum when the, when the Thames froze over and crops around the world failed. In fact, Crops are failing now. Northern China is experiencing widespread hunger as exceptional cold destroyed the winter cereal crop. Australia, on the other hand, has moved from a dry cycle to a wet cycle. This is not climate change. It's a natural cycle. I have challenged the Greens on many occasions to prove their position with empirical scientific evidence, data, and they have been unable to, repeatedly unable. Indeed, today is day number 502 of my challenge in the Senate to the Greens to simply provide the scientific evidence for their claims and for their alarm and to debate me on the science. Look at them all, looking at their phones, they won't look at me. I challenged the current Greens Senate leader ten and, three, ten and a quarter years ago. 
Nothing. Ten and a quarter years, more than a decade. Nothing. I noticed that the world-renowned scientist Tony Heller, who relies on solid data, has today challenged the Greens to a debate on social media. That's not going to happen either. And now we see the Nats. Well, that's another joke. So, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The Greens have no carbon budget and they have no idea. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, once again, it's clear that the Greens and the Labor Party are not interested in the facts facing Australia and our planet. And as we've just heard from Senator Lyons' contribution, who did not mention one policy measure we have in place to combat uh, climate change. Uh, it's uh, clear that Labor is operating in an alternate reality. And we only have to look at the chaos and the confusion in the Labor Party as one spokesman is dumped and the deck chairs are rearranged on the faltering ship. Of course, we know that Mr Albanese backflipped on his support for uh, the shadow spokesperson, Mr Butler, in a desperate attempt to save his stumbling leadership. But moving Mr Butler out and putting Mr Bowen in doesn't change the fact that Labor does not have a single policy which will reduce emissions or lower energy prices. And Mr Bowen bragged about being a key architect of Labor's failed climate policies that it took to the last election and to which they are still clinging. And we know that independent economic modelling showed that Labor's 45 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030 and its 50 per cent renewable energy target would hurt our economy badly and cost tens of thousands of jobs. And the member for Hunter has called them out on this. And of course, we still see Labor hopelessly divided. As Mr Fitzgibbon pointed out in the nine newspapers in November, after 14 years of trying, he said, the Labor Party has made not one contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. And so while we see Labor fighting amongst themselves, and while we see the member for Cryo, Mr Miles, one minute he's up in a coal mine, the next minute he's saying that the end of thermal coal would be a good thing, uh, he's flip-flopping all over the place, while Labor is all at sea, the Morrison government is getting on with doing the heavy lifting required. The Morrison government has a clear and a successful emissions reduction policy which has allowed us to meet and beat our 2020 target and will ensure we meet and beat our 2030 target. Wholesale electricity prices have fallen for 16 months in a row and quarterly prices are at their lowest level in six years. We have also seen a record eight consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year CPI reductions in retail electricity prices, putting more money in the hip pockets of Australian families and businesses. As Prime Minister Morrison told the National Press Club yesterday, Australia's economic recovery plan is underpinned by delivering affordable and reliable energy. And this positions Australia to be effective in the lower and ultimately net zero emissions global economy that is a part of our future. The Prime Minister was quite clear yesterday. Our goal is to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. Critical to this outcome are the advances made in science and technology. and These are needed to commercially transform advanced economies and countries along with the developing world. Here in Australia, we will invest and partner in technology breakthroughs. These are needed to reduce and offset emissions so that our heavy industry in particular and industry more broadly can continue to grow and protect our jobs and living standards while at the same time keeping energy costs down. As the Prime Minister has made very clear, we will not tax our way to net zero emissions which would put the cost on Australians in the cities and in our regions. He's very, very clear. Getting to net zero should be about technology, not taxes and higher electricity prices. And we are getting on with the job. 
Just look at our record. Emissions fell by 3 per cent in the year to June 2020, to their lowest level since 1998, meaning we are now nearly 17 per cent below 2005 levels. This compares to reductions of approximately 9 per cent on average across the OECD, 1 per cent in New Zealand and less than 1 per cent in Canada. Labor and the Greens don't like to hear the truth, but these are the facts. Under the leadership of Minister Taylor, our $18 billion technology investment roadmap gets underway this year. There is a $1.9 billion commitment to develop clean energy technologies such as hydrogen, green steel and carbon capture and storage. We're pursuing global partnerships with countries including Japan, the United States, the UK, Korea and Singapore. Our multi-billion dollar energy and emissions reduction agreement with New South Wales is being implemented and we hope other states will follow. Agreements are in place to accelerate major transmission projects in New South Wales and Tasmania, with Victoria and South Australia to follow this year. The government is building Snowy 2.0 and we're rolling out our $200 million program to build new diesel storage facilities. And of course, one of the great recipients of our fuel production payment and our, our fuel security package is the Geelong refinery and its 700 workers. And I was absolutely delighted to join with Minister Taylor in making an announcement about the bring forward of the fuel production payment in Geelong in December last year. The clean energy regulator estimates that a record seven gigawatts of new renewable capacity was installed last year. These are the facts. This is 11 per cent higher than the previous record set in 2019 at 6.3 gigawatts. This represents more than the entire renewable capacity installed under the previous Labor government, which was 5.6 gigawatts from December 2007 to September 2013. These are the facts. A solar installation boom drove this new record despite COVID-19 restrictions which impacted rooftop solar installation rates for part of the year. We have a great story to tell here in Australia. One in four Australian homes have solar, which is the highest uptake of household solar in the world. And this all helps to reduce household energy bills and reduce emissions. Over the last quarter of 2020, the share of renewables in the national electricity market exceeded 30 per cent. 30 per cent. In 2020, a record 53.6 terawatt hours of electricity was generated from re renewables, including rooftop solar, in the national electricity market. This is a whopping 16 per cent higher than the previous record set in 2019. So the bottom line is, Mr Acting Deputy President, we are on track to meet and beat our targets, the Coyote Eero targets by 459 million tonnes, along with the 2030 Paris target, which has improved over the last two years by 639 million tonnes. This is the equivalent of removing 14.7 million cars off the road, not for one year, but for 15 years. The Morrison government is delivering on emissions reduction while Labor dithers as to how to do it. Labor's fighting internally and Australians have worked out that they have completely lost the plot when it comes to tackling climate action and climate change. Labor doesn't know what its 2030 target looks like. They don't know how much it will cost or how it will be achieved. Only the Morrison government will achieve the outcomes that we need and this country needs to reduce our emissions and at the same time protect our industries and protect our jobs. We are taking real and practical action and I've talked about in this contribution some of the very important results that we are delivering to protect our economy, to protect jobs, to drive record renewable investment, 
to see one in four Australian homes take up solar, but to do so in a way which takes Australia forward. And I am incredibly proud of the work of this government. I am incredibly proud of the leadership of our Prime Minister to drive down emissions, to take strong action on climate change whilst protecting our jobs and our industries. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this government's climate policies are an absolute mess. They are an international embarrassment. They are irresponsible. And as a result, all of us are missing out on the opportunity to create good, clean energy jobs, jobs that Australians desperately need right now. But Australia is being left behind. The rest of the world is moving forward while Prime Minister Scott Morrison drags his feet. There is a real global consensus on climate change. And I'm not just talking about the Biden administration in the US that will take climate change action and emissions reductions uh, seriously. It's also the US, it's Canada, it's Germany, it's France, it's New Zealand. It's all of our major allies and all of our major partners around the world. Uh, and right here at home, it's the Business Council, the Australian Industry Group, the Property Council. It's our largest airline. It's our biggest mining company. It's our biggest bank, our biggest telecommunications provider. It's a long list of leading businesses, organisations and not-for-profits who have made commitments to taking action on climate. Uh, and today, the only people missing are the Morrison government. Scott Morrison is absolutely isolated on this issue. Labor, on the other hand, we are confident and positive about our future. We know that we can reach a better future together, and really, everyone else agrees. So we need the Morrison government to make a plan for climate action now. In the past eight years, this Liberal national government has had 22 energy policies, 22 energy policies in just eight years. And what has this led to? It's led to absolute chaos, and it's led to higher electricity prices and higher emissions. And this isn't even the worst of their inaction. According to an independent report from Deloitte Access Economics, the Prime Minister's refusal to take action could crush trade, it could tra crush tourism, mining and service industries. That report suggests that the government's inaction and refusal to adopt zero emissions by 2050 will actually devastate our economy. That action, inaction could cost up to 880,000 jobs and could slash 3.4 trillion from GDP by 2070. But if the government actually took action and delivered net zero emissions by 2050, the report predicts it would actually create 250,000 jobs. We have just experienced our deepest recession in almost 100 years, and we know that over 2 million Australians are still out of work or they can't get enough hours, uh, and they're screaming out for a jobs plan from this government. And action on climate change, it delivers jobs. It delivers lower power bills. It grows the economy. It delivers higher wages, and so now, right now, is the time to take that action. Scott Morrison can no longer pretend that he is taking action on climate change, and Australians need real climate action, or we will all be left paying the price. We have to hit net zero carbon pollution by 2050. The world is decarbonising. And we need to make sure that Australia doesn't get left behind. We need to make sure that we take full advantage of the opportunities that this presents to a country like ours. 
Um, because with the right plan and with the right vision, Australia can be a clean energy superpower with a new generation of jobs and cheaper power bills. We have some of the best wind and wave resources in the world. We have the highest average solar radiation per square metre of any continent. And we have some of the best engineers and scientists in the world to take advantage of this. Working towards a low carbon future means opportunities for our manufacturing sectors. It means opportunities for energy exports. It means opportunities for rare earth minerals mining. And it means opportunities for good, secure, clean energy jobs. So take, for example, our plan to rewire the nation. The current energy network takes no account of the rise of renewables. It was designed for another time. And this is why a Labor government would take action to rebuild and modernise the national energy grid. Rebuilding the grid will itself create thousands of jobs, particularly in regional Australia, uh, and it will deliver up to $40 billion in benefits. This just makes sense. And Labor governments get things done. The Victorian government, for example, last year announced that the Southern Hemisphere's biggest battery is to be built just outside of Geelong. This project will create good jobs. It will drive down electricity prices. It will boost reliability. It will help support Victoria's transition to renewable energy. And it'll be good for the economy as well. Independent analysis shows that every dollar invested in this 300 megawatt battery will deliver more than $2 in benefits to Victorian households and businesses. And in addition to the big projects, the Victorian government is also helping local businesses and communities access clean energy. Just recently, they delivered grants across the states to fund projects like community solar farms, batteries and solar electricity systems for sports clubs. Victoria is on track to hit its renewable energies targets and it's embracing new technologies and, and investing in renewables. Uh, and it's not just Victoria. Every state and territory is on board, so the Morrison government needs to take action Thank now. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Rice. President, I want to take you back to the first day of Parliament last year, when all of us members of Parliament, when we arrived in Canberra, it was shrouded in smoke. The bushfires were raging from last summer's black summer. Of course, we know when the, finally the fires were out, that we had 33 people that died in those fires. And an estimate is that 445 people died from smoke inhalation from those fires. We had thousands of lives, of people's livelihoods of their homes affected, and homes which are still being rebuilt. They were the worst fires ever in Australia's history. 20 per cent of our mainland forests burnt. Over three billion animals were killed. Those of us that had been seeing our hotter, drier climate resulting in the weather conditions that we experienced last summer thought, what devastation. But maybe finally, seeing these fires occurred, maybe finally that as a country we would listen to the science. We would recognise that, yep, this is a climate crisis, that we need to take action, that we need to act on our reducing our carbon pollution in accordance with what the science says. The science is very clear, and it was reiterated last week by the Climate um, Targets Panel, where it says that if we are going to meet our, tariffs, our Paris target globally of keeping global heating to below two degrees, that we need to have at least a 50 per cent cut in carbon pollution by 2030. And if we want to keep global heating below one and a half degrees, we need a greater than 75 per cent cut in our carbon pollution by 2030. But sadly, no. We went through those fires 
The science is so clear. But we have a government and we have a Labor Party that are still in absolute denial. Because delay in acting on our climate crisis is denial. If you are serious about acting on our climate crisis, we need that urgent action now to get those cuts of at least half of our carbon pollution, if not three quarters, in the next decade. And that means getting out of coal and gas and oil. That means transitioning completely to a clean energy economy. I've heard the contributions from both sides talking up renewables, and renewables are great, and we need them. And all of this technology is terrific, but it is not going to amount to a hill of beans unless we are also getting out of coal and gas and oil, both domestically and, ex and in our export markets. We need to get the coal and gas and oil industries, those big industry barons who are currently determining what's in the climate and energy policies of both the government and the Labor Party, out of that role. We need to be listening to the science, listening to the people, taking action which is consistent with the science in order to keep people safe. Just like people were concerned about keeping people safe in last summer's fires, we need zero carbon. We need Order. action Order, urgently Senator to Rice. keep people Thank safe. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I listened to the debate carefully and read the resolution, and what a choice. Um, we we'll either support uh, the Greens Party's resolution or uh, hang out with the troglodytes in the government on these questions. It's not a happy choice. Um, we are entitled, I think, uh, in the Labor Party to approach Greens resolutions on climate change with a little bit of scepticism. This year will be the 11th or 12th, I've lost count, anniversary of the Greens political party voting with the Liberals. Uh, on the CPRS, and imagine, imagine what a world, Order, imagine what a world we would be living in today Order. in Australia. We would have lower emissions in the country. We would have had much less, Rice, much Order. less carbon emitted into the atmosphere. We would have had lower power prices, consistently lower, stable power prices, because there would have been an energy investment framework that would have allowed the private sector and government to work together to deliver a cleaner energy mix. There would have been more jobs, better jobs, in the Australian economy, particularly in the regions, and we would have continued to export coal uh, to global markets at the same time as Australia wouldn't have been internationally isolated, going economically backwards uh, and, uh, and bleeding jobs, particularly in our regional towns. But I don't want to spend too much on time on the Greens political party today. I want to spend a little bit more time on the government. I listened to Senator Henderson's contribution very, very carefully. Uh, and it reminded me that where the government's front is at the moment, what they say uh, on climate change is a little bit like what St Augustine had to say about chastity. Uh, that is, we're, we're all for it. Just not yet. Uh, now, there's three kinds of politicians in the Liberal and National Party on these questions. There's the front, what we saw from Senator Henderson, the modern Liberals, the sort of mealy-mouthed apologists, the craven capitulation to the government's backbench. We saw the leader of the government in the Senate in question time, Senator Birmingham. A revolting display, really, of a sort of quivering, craven capitulation to the backbench on one hand, but wanting to present to the Australian community as if there was some real action on climate change and energy policy. The second group is the hard right in the Liberal and National Party. They try and keep their views uh, in the shadows as much as possible, apart from when the now Prime Minister bursts out on the floor of the parliament with a big lump of coal and waves it around. I mean, it was carefully varnished so none of the coal dust would dirty his beautiful white shirt, something that most of the workers who Senator Canavan you know, cosplay dresses as when he puts his high vis on. They don't have that luxury. Uh, so you've got the hard right, Senator Canavan, who'll 
say that he supports coal workers in regional Queensland on one hand, but apparently wants to decouple the Australian economy uh, from the Chinese economy on the other. So he's for jobs on one hand and not for jobs on the other. He's all for mining workers in the iron ore industry, but he wants to introduce an export levy uh, onto Australian iron ore exports. He says he's for manufacturing, but released and led the maddest manufacturing plan that any political party has released that would have pushed up, if ever adopted by the government, would push up power prices and drive tens of thousands of Australian jobs offshore. And then you've got the third loop, the, the, the third group, the sort of fruit loops, the climate science deniers. There's a common thread with this group. They're not big on climate science. They're not particularly big on coronavirus and public epidemiology science either. You know, you've got the, Mr. Kelly hanging out with Pete Evans and all of the other Fruit Loops in the, in the social media world who want to tell Australians that they should not take the vaccine, sending a dangerous message, hanging out with all of the QAnon conspiracy theorists. And that group is such a big group on the coalition backbench. That's the reason why the government's had more than 20 energy policies over the course of the eight unhappy years that this government has been in office. Now, there is a strong alternative. The Labor Party represents a strong alternative on these issues. Chris Bowen said late last week, climate policy is jobs policy, energy policy is jobs policy, and we would have in government very simple objectives, driving down the price of electricity and energy, delivering more good jobs in our suburbs and our regions a cleaner environment, lower emissions, uh, and continuing to try and drive a position where we've got good jobs and a future in our regions and our country towns, and Australia once again rejoins the international community on these questions and delivers real positive change on the question of climate. Senator Faruqi. Deputy President. This morning, the People's Climate Rally came to the lawns of Parliament House. They came to the People's House today to make sure that politicians are confronted with the reality of the climate crisis at the start of the parliamentary year, because they know that two centuries of colonization have undone the millennia of management and care of country by First Nations people. For us, it's the love of this planet and its people that drives our action on climate. But our rage has to match our love, rage at the harm being done by the climate crisis to communities across the global south and right here, rage at the big corporations and politicians who put profit ahead of people, and rage at the liberals and labor who have taken millions of dollars in donations from coal and gas corporations. And while the world is taking action to address the climate emergency, Scott Morrison and Rupert Murdoch have parked Australia in a historical cul-de-sac. They have made Australia a pariah of the world. Last summer, we saw fires savage and ravage large parts of our country. We saw drought along the Murray Darling and weeks of smoke and ash choking our cities. This summer, we saw more of the same, from major flooding and rain battering New South Wales coasts to heat waves and fires in Perth. Burning coal, oil and gas is making extreme weather events more intense and more frequent. The world's current greenhouse gas reduction promises are not enough to limit global warming to below 2 degrees C and we must cut pollution rapidly. The window to do this is open till 2030, not 2050. And that's why the Greens want to make sure that global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees and our targets are of 75% emissions reductions by 2030. We say no to a gaslit recovery because that's no recovery at all. 
We demand climate justice. We know that there is no justice in a transition to a post-carbon economy that leaves control of green industries in the hands of big corporations. The rampant planet-abusing consumption and extraction of resources by giant corporations and governments who are captured by these polluting interests have brought us to the place we are at today in a climate emergency. Frankly, we know that there is no hope for true climate justice in a capitalist, profit-driven society like ours. We cannot address the climate crisis and achieve justice without changing the economic system that demands constant extraction. And we will show that people matter. Together, our power, the power of the people, is much greater than conservative politicians that sit here, than the media barons that are out there, and then rabid corporations who just are full of greed. Senator Steele, John. Thank you. Uh, just before I uh, rolled in here, I got off the phone with a mate of mine uh, in the eastern suburbs of Perth. And he said to me, Jordan, there's ash fallen over the house. We can't, none of us here can imagine what it is like to be in that situation. None of us can imagine it. You know, we're in this place, air conditioned, we're all safe, it's fine. Meanwhile, right now, people are losing their homes. We don't know, could be fighting for their lives. We know that at least 30 homes have been lost, probably more. We know that families will be bunking with each other, having packed everything in the car and got out of there as quickly as they can. And they will now be confronting the beginnings of a truth, a truth that their lives have changed forever, that it will never quite be the same again. And as they begin that understanding, that reconciliation with the truth, that realisation, the major parties in this place should be confronting truths of their own. The truth that climate change is making these events worse. The truth that the burning of coal, oil and gas is the largest contributor to global heating. And the truth that the policies of Australian governments, Liberal and Labour alike, have done nothing but make the situation worse, have done nothing but burn more of these chemicals, have done nothing but block global action. They may well look to this place for that truth, but they will not find it. They will not find it among the Labour and Liberal parties here today. Why? Because both sides of Parliament take money from the polluters, from the Chevrons and the Woodsides, from the Clive Palmers and the Gina Reinharts. This place on the question of climate is bought and paid for by the big end of town that's making money off a climate crisis. And so it is only the Greens at moments like these that are willing to state the truth that climate change is putting lives at risk, that coal, oil and gas are driving it and that it is possible to stop it with government action, rapid action, which we must take now. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, if you haven't got a 2030 emissions reduction target in line with the climate science, you might as well line up with the climate change deniers. And I'll point out that neither of the major parties, neither the coalition nor the ALP in this place, have got a 2030 target in line with the climate science. In fact, Labor doesn't even have a 2030 target at all. And why is that? Why do both the major parties fail to put in place policies in line with what the science is telling us? Because they are corrupted by the dirty donations they take from the fossil fuel industries. And we know, because the donations data came out yesterday, 
a combined over a million dollars flowed into the pockets, dirty money, into the pockets of the major parties in this place from the fossil fuel corporations. And what do they get for it? They get to write things like a gas-led recovery, supported by both the major parties in this place, where they're not only backing in new gas developments, new fossil fuel developments, they want to throw public subsidies at them. It is a corruption of our democracy and it is exposing the Australian people to massive risk and, to some of them, massive risk to their lives. Look reality in the eye. The feedback loops are kicking in. The tipping points are upon us. We've got to stop logging, stop land clearing, plant more trees, no new fossil fuels, rapid transition out of the fossil fuel industry and invest in our communities, invest in renewables, invest in reforestation, invest in electrifying our transport networks, create the jobs and the prosperity McKinney, and give our people your safer time lives. Has expired. The question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Real parent.
Lock the doors. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone tell of the ayes. Senator Davey tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 33. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Thanks, Senators. Thanks, Thanks.